think we're going to get going. It's 2 o'clock. I see a few stragglers coming in, but we might as well get started because uh, we have a lot of material. So there's a warning for you. My name is Jamie. This is Steve. Our talk title is Dynamic Wheel Mobility, and keeping in with the theme of the ISS 2015, uh, it's subtitled The Next Chapter in the Ultralight, Ultralight Wheelchair Evolution. Now, that's a statement. Uh, later on, we have it as a question, but um, you know that's open for discussion. <clears throat> um, I'll briefly introduce myself. Um, as I said, Jamie Borisov, I'm a rehab, rehab engineer from BCIT and i in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm funded through uh, various federal uh, grant programs and CERC and CRC uh, and that sort of thing. But also a disclosure, I'm with a manufacturer um, with PDG Mobility, and I have to make that disclosure because we will be talking about some of their products, or in particular, the Elevation Wheelchair. And so keep that in mind, I am affiliated with that company. And without further ado, though, we're going to send it over to Steve. He's going to introduce himself and then also take you through a bunch of slides of some theory and some background about the clinical practice guidelines and these sorts of things. Yeah, so I'm a, a clinical specialist in seating wheeled mobility at the Cleveland VASCI. Um, some of you may, may know me from that. Um, and uh, I, I'm also uh, I'm a, a free time faculty at another facility, and that's the uh, Human Reverse Engineering Laboratory. Maybe you've heard of it, Furl. Um, and uh, basically, when I started looking at this concept of dynamic reconfiguration that we're going to talk about, um, I was really excited because um, with just by making some modifications to actually an existing product, I was able to do some pretty interesting things. Um, and I knew there were measurable things that could make a difference. So the first thing I was thinking was, well, um, maybe I'll contact the folks over at Hurl, Human Engineering Re Research Laboratory, because I know they got the technology to measure this. So um, I got a hold of uh, Dr. Kuntz over there, and uh, she set up an appointment with Roy Cooper, who's, um, who's the, one of the head, head people over there, uh, who spoke earlier today. And um, it took about two months to get the appointment. Um, waiting and waiting to show them all these wonderful things with dynamic reconfiguration. And day came, I got in the car, drove from Cleveland to Pittsburgh, and um, I got there, and uh, Dr. Kuntz, uh, Ali was, was a little embarrassed, but whoever keeps Dr. Cooper's time schedule apparently didn't realize that he also had a conflict, and he was actually in uh, Disney World at a marathon, so um, running a race. So I figured, oh, I'll be polite, and I, I got my little tour, and I, had, I did have a good conversation with Dr. Kuntz. Um, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm going get, to get them somehow. And uh, I, I got a tour of all their facilities and their amazing capabilities, and I think, well, I better set up shop for myself if I want to get the word out about this. Um, and as I was looking at their technology, I, I noticed there was one piece that maybe I could actually top these guys. Um, and I went ahead and got it, and it was the, uh, the SM6G6900A data collection system. Um, and this thing was fantastic. It allowed me to get high resolution video capture, kinematics, kinetics, has accelerometers, data logging, um, and it was something that I knew Dr. Kuntz didn't have in her lab. And that's because it was a Galaxy S5 and I know she has an X, S4. Um, my point is with this whole slide here is that um, some of the greatest innovations already exist. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is, is not brand new cutting edge technology. And, and the way we're, we're going to present it to you is using very relatively simple means that I think will pick up demonstrable differences. Um, they're small differences um, to people who don't use wheelchairs, but both of us believe that this makes a significant difference. And we're going to pose two questions to you. Question one is, is our current best practice of providing one configuration that's optimized for propulsion across smooth level surfaces really an effective way to imp implement the upper limb CPGs? The second question is, if tomorrow's chairs, if we're focusing exclusively on making them as light as possible, are they going to be any more effective in our ability to prevent upper limb pain and overuse? And both of us feel strongly, um, despite our, our quite different backgrounds, quite different geographies, that the answer to that question is no. And we're proposing a, a concept that we call dynamic wheeled mobility. Different than dynamic seating, this, this has to do more with being able to get out and interact and, and deal with what people who use wheelchairs normally have to deal with in the environment. It's a new approach that involves using on-the-flight adjustments 
and add-on components to give users the ability to quickly change the base configuration of their chair for improved usability in multiple environments and multiple activities. But first, I'll just quickly review the clinical practice guidelines for preservation of upper limb function. They've been around for about 10 years now. Um, probably due for an updating, but actually still pretty sound in, in their premise. Um, in the ergonomic section, some of the, the recommendations are to minimize the frequency of upper limb tasks, minimize the forces experienced during upper limb tasks, and minimize extreme and potentially injurious positions, which also includes placing the hand above the shoulder, which if you use a wheelchair is extremely difficult to do, um, av avoiding extreme positions of the wrist, external rotation, and shoulder internal rotation, and abduction. To provide manual wheelchair users with a high strength, fully customizable wheelchair made of the lightest possible material. Um, lightest possible. That could be interpreted different ways. Um, hopefully, we'll persuade you to our way as far as interpretation. That the wheelchair should be configured so the rear axle is located as far forward as possible without compromising the stability of the user. And that it's positioned so that the user's elbow angle is approximately 100 and 120 degrees with respect to the push room. To instruct wheelchair users with SCI to use long, smooth strokes that limit high impacts on the push rim and to allow the hand to drift down naturally, keeping it below the push rim when not in contact. Um, and, and, and it's a few different uh, lectures today have talked about the semicircular being the preferred pattern and then the arc pattern. And is the arc pattern always bad? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contend that, that it isn't always bad. And not only am I going to contend that it's not always bad, that sometimes it's preferred, I'm actually going to optimize how we do that arc pattern. Instruct individuals with SCI who complete independent transfers to perform level transfers when possible, avoid positions of impingement. Um, so those things have given us a solid foundation for evidence-based practice. But are they set in stone? The role of configuration in the CPGs, per se, um, in minimizing forces, frequency, and extreme positions during activities that don't involve propulsion, the, the wheelchair really doesn't address those things. The equipment rec recommendations regarding configuration really don't talk about transfers reaching our community environments. Other CPGs talk about those things, but the actual role of wheelchair configuration isn't, isn't addressed. It's all propulsion. Training recommendations don't con address conditions such as slopes and surfaces that have higher rolling resistance. Can you use a semicircular pattern on a slope? I think not. Training recommendations involving transfers don't, talk, don't address at all about the wheelchair's potential to minimize gaps, surface discrepancies, rear wheel clearance. They're not addressed because the current, most current ultralight designs can address them, and we think that should change. Ultralight designs and many components commonly used on today's models have been involved. These clinical practice guidelines are 10 years old. Equipment has gone a long way in the last 10 years. Most of the add-on components that a lot of people now regularly use on their ultralight didn't exist. But yet the, the upper limb CPGs st still continue to be relevant, but it's just the ultralight's role has been so limited in fulfilling them. So our question is, what might be possible if we were to design the ultralight around the CPGs instead of the other way around. And I'll just briefly talk about the uh, multi-contextual usability of the wheelchair. Usability is just the extent to which a product can be used by a specified group of users to achieve effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in a specified context to use. How are today's wheelchairs doing? Well, there's some big limitations. While conventional designs provide sufficient adjustability to be customized to the user, the configuration itself is static. It can't be changed. And anything, anything that's static can never possibly provide optimal usability in every functional task and activity in which a person who uses an ultralight wheelchair full time needs to use their wheelchair. So we've tended to focus a lot on propulsion and positioning. Under dynamic wheel mobility theory, we think that should be the starting point. And then from that point on, we need to look at 
improving usability in those other areas. So a properly configured chair, as we define it today, is just the baseline under dynamic wheel mobility. Um, and usually with the current st status quo, it's, it's making concessions and trade-offs. And we're never gonna totally eliminate those, but we think we can make much less than we currently do. So it, it is a significant problem. And, and even the, when we consider a chair dialed in for level, ultimate le smooth level propulsion, are we really doing that? How many people have heard these complaints? If my rear wheel is that far forward, I won't be able to transfer over it. I need to be able to bridge over my backrest so I can pull up my pants without flipping backwards. My chair is not as tippy as I'd like because I still have to be able to get up ramps. Is that configuration really still optimal for a smooth level propulsion? Whenever a static configuration provides suboptimal usability in a given context, the user will almost always be subjective to greater forces, inefficiency, and more extreme positions. One of those studies is that looks at are these real medical problems is the WESPI, the Wheelchair User Shoulder Pain Index. And it looked at several areas of shoulder pain and found that users reported pain when propelling up inclines, on outdoor surfaces, during overhead lifting, transfers from tub to wheelchair, which is one of those things where there's going to be a bigger transfer gap, long carpeted halls and ramps at the Gaylord Opera Land, oh, sorry, um, but it's, I, I don't know, I had, I had to vent a little bit because this place does get me sometimes, and washing your back. Now, I don't think we can really do much as far as washing your back with an ultralight, but we think we can, we can make some suggestions as far as potential in those other areas. Because ultralights must be used in multiple contexts, and the only way you're going to do that is to be able to provide multiple configurations. Dyma dynamic wheeled mobility can do that. I believe it's yours. Oh, no, it's still my section, sorry. Conventional configurations, angle adjustable users, and the quad penalty. Um, I've, I've done more than a few static configurations in my time, and, and, and typically with SCI, we find that the, these are two pretty representative chairs of somebody that has like a low cervical injury um, versus a very low lumbar injury. Um, the one at the, on the left being for a C6 user, um, the one on the right for someone that's caught a, almost caught a climber. Um, and the example I'm going to do of a person that has one of those lower level entries is, is Toto L1, who's actually, that's a username on character community. And he uses a O-Racing um, XTR2, which um, that's the CAD drawing for it. It's posted online. It's got a very conservative center of gravity, um, relatively short back, not a lot of seat slope. But this is what he's able to do because he has very intact trunk muscles, very good back extensors. So he just flips his chair around, transfers nothing. But if, if you look how he's sitting, his, his backrest really doesn't have to provide much support. Again, minimal, minimal seat angle, but look how easily he goes over the curb there. One more time. And this, this kind of goes to show the role that the trunk muscles can play. One more time, let's see if I can get this here. Okay, right there, body's behind the axle. Look how smoothly and seamlessly his body's in front of the axle and then he's up and over. Hardly any moment, it's almost imperceptible. And then we have the quad penalty. And this, this kind of, if I had to define it, it would say that the, the person that needs the most efficient, lightest, effective chair isn't able to get it. Um, um, and this is just a study by, uh, by, by uh, Danny Gagnano, and it's just on the effect of trunk impairments. Um, it's a 2009 study, very useful information about the role of people that don't have that level of trunk control and how that affects their ability to propel. But I just want to go into our, our, our quad chair, which is Gabe, and he had a, a top-end Terminator, and he, he, he had gotten a couple ones since then, but he really liked the seat slope on his old chrome molly chair. And the, 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 the holdup on that was that it was a, a rear seat to forehead of about 14 inches, and nobody could do that anymore. But he really did like that seat angle. Um, but he had a hard time transferring out of it. 
So we used a, a, a dimension, and this might be useful, and, and Terry, I do believe this is standard now on tie lights CADs, is occupied frame length, which is the distance from the front of the back post to the front of the footrest. And the reason that's important to have on a CAD drawing is because you can measure that on an actual chair by pushing it up against the wall and measuring from the front of the back post to the wall. So it was 22 inches, um, and we couldn't get a 14 inch seat to four height, but we were able to tell them the seat angle, which we were able to measure. So we had a 15 degree seat angle with a, with, um, with a OFL of, of 22, and then we could figure out what the front seat height was, which was 18.4. And what, what, we, what we did was we wanted an 85 degree frame angle to give more frame tubing to be able to do the transfer. So this is the chair that resulted. So it doesn't, compared to that chrome molly, the bend starts a little bit later. He's got more frame tubing, so he can get out in front of the wheel to transfer. But look at what, what still remains. And that's, and, and, and Gabe was a super quad, he still is. Um, but look how far, far down he is in the chair. To get over that wheel, it's still gonna be a bear to transfer. And this guy has some of the worst shoulders you would ever see. Um, you know, he's, he's able to do a lot more than his level of injury would ever suggest. Um, but his shoulders are bad, and that's because of the quad penalty. It might look like a Dodge Charger, one of the current ones that look really cool, and even cop cars I get envious of. But it's more like my first car, which was a 76 Charger, which had a slant six engine, had no get up at whatsoever. Um, but it also, um, quads, we, we have heavier chairs, and we're not as efficient being able to do it. It's like having a car that's stuck in first gear and has a, a clutch that slips. We can't transfer energy. We don't have that core stability. DWM technologies give us a potential to rewrite the rules with regard to wheelchair configuration. If we change the rules, then we can do a better job of implementing the CPGs. So we're going to talk about the props or the product that we use in this uh, presentation. Mine is the, what I call the DWM concept, concept chair. And what that is, it's an Icon A1. It's an early production demo that I did some modifications. What this chair will allow me to do in this video is I have two and a half inches of 4F seat adjustability two and a half inches. Doesn't seem like much, but I think the videos will bear out that it can do a lot. So that's all it does. Is the sliding seat a new concept? No. Back in 1991, Cliff Brubaker wrote about that as a novel way to adjust center of gravity and also noted that it would be helpful to go up slopes because you don't have to lean forward to, and worry about tipping backwards. 1991. Um, and then I also have two and a half inches of wheelbase adjustment that I can do while I'm in the chair. Um, there's a detente in there. Um, don't try these at home. It was an early production demo. Um, but it, it has learned me, allowed me to, to learn a lot, and that's why I wanted to go to Hurl in the first place. Um, and then, then there's Jamie's chair, which is the elevation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'll tell you briefly about this chair. It's an ultralight rigid wheelchair, and it has um, two main functions. Next slide there. It has 10 inches of seat height adjustment, so you can adjust your seat while you're sitting in it on the fly to do various activities. It um, also has 30 degrees of on the fly backrest adjustment. And so we'll be showing you later examples of how uh, a backrest adjustment that you can use on the fly lets you do a lot of um, activities a little bit easier. Um, people often ask, uh, when I do elevate above the horizontal, why aren't I sliding out of my chair? I'm a T3 Asia A complete para, so I have no trunk. I'll fall over if I lean forward. Um, but there's a bit of a trick that's happening here. There's the side guards in my chair are lifting up the front of the cushion, and it forms a little bit of a pocket, and it reduces the shear forces uh, on the user in the seat. So I'm able to stay up here and do all sorts of things and wheel while I'm up here, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, this is just a brief uh, overview of the nuts and bolts. There's just gas springs that are doing the lifting. But on the left, this is a good, uh, a really important point. Uh, there's just two levers underneath the seat, and they're very easy to operate. And that's kind of one of our um, dynamic wheel mobility rules, is that it has to be easy to use, and you have to be able to do it quickly, on the fly. Um, otherwise, you'll never use it. And I can even tell you a story about our, our, one of our first chairs had a backrest adjustment that was not nearly as easy. And I tell you, I never used it myself. And then when we went to the current way it's done, all of a sudden I started using it more and more and I discovered more and more uses for it. So I think that's something really to keep in mind uh, as we go along. And, and I think we're, we're, we're both learning more and more uses for, for these, these, these adjustments. Um, 
it, it's amazing, and, and it's like to know what other potential might be out there. Hopefully, we can get you guys thinking about that by the end of this. Um, now, briefly, and nobody freak out, I'm going to just talk about physics for therapists. And basically, this is to dispel the myth that lightness, lighter is always better, and to talk about what really constitutes rolling resistance. And it's good to see Jim Black here because he's got a term rollability, which has to do with a, with a lot of this. Um, but what are, what are the factors that influence propulsion efficiency with respect to rolling resistance? Well, the main one, and we all know this, is the distribution of mass over the rear wheels and casters. Um, more, more, a, a bigger wheel has less rolling resistance, you put more weight over that, the better off you're going to be. But the other thing is that part of rolling resistance is the environment that the chair is moving in, friction due to rolling resistance. And uh, there's no better example of it than the good old Gaylord Opryland when you have a room that's a quarter mile away and you've got to roll on carpet to make it to the, to the conference. And then this is just a, a recent article. It's in um, January's uh, New Mobility that uh, Dr. Spriegel wrote, but he was looking at propulsion torque. Rolling a chair on carpet, 33% greater uh, torque required compared to a smooth surface during acceleration, and 60% greater torque during steady state propulsion. But um, really one of the major factors is friction is dependent on the weight of the occupied wheelchair and the interaction between the tires and the rolling surface. Pop quiz. According to strict DWM doctrine, casters are like, anyone? Is he here? How about Ian? He's got a word for us. Casters are like parasites. No, Ian Dennison uh, coined that term uh, a few years ago, and we think it's a very uh, appropriate. Yes, and he could have he could have totally torpedoed that joke had he not answered. Because it's, uh, nice to meet you, Ian. <laughs> and one of the biggest things is the quality of the individual components on on the chair. A, a, a rigid frame chair to start with is going to hold. All those, all those bearings and wheels and casters in very good alignment for efficiency. Um, but th that, plays, that plays a very, very large role in the rolling resistance of the chair. What are we not talking about? Oh, and just how much of a role do casters play? This is one of those add-ons, wheel blades, um, and they're, they're distributed in this country by Autobach. And uh, it, it provides a very good demonstration. Um, I, I got a demo set just a few weeks ago, and I got a chance to try them out in the snow. Okay, so that's about a quarter inch of, of packed snow, and it, sometimes you see this stuff and it's kind of hard to realize what's, what's at play, but I would never do this in, my, in, in the chair I'm sitting in right now. With the four-inch casters, I would just dig in, and I don't live on a hill. I just coast. So the casters do play a huge role in rolling resistance. What about weight? Does a five to 10 pound difference really make a, make a difference in the efficiency of the chair? No, not really. Um, small difference, but when you look at old Tomlinson's diagram of, of rolling resistance, it's got this mass acting down on the chair. Well, what is that mass? It's the mass of the chair and the user. 200 pounds of me, 24 pounds of chair. That 200 pounds is a big percentage of the mass. So it's the weight of the user that matters most. You're on? All right, so. When you're thinking about weight, uh, and, we, and we don't want to discount weight because the weight of the chair is very important, and where is it really most important? And that's Absolutely. for most active users, and that's the people we're talking about, just loading the car into, or loading the wheelchair into the car. And that's clearly an issue, and that's not something we're going to ever discount. Um, but I do, I, I often get asked with this chair that's been on the, it's, it's on the market, uh, and I've been using it for a long time, is, well, how do I, can I get into a car with this chair? It weighs. This new version of it weighs 22 pounds in its base weight, which is you know three or four pounds heavier than a lot of the other ultralights uh, on the market. And you can load it into a car like pretty much any other ultralight wheelchair. It does weigh a few pounds uh, heavier. So that's something to keep in mind. If you do have a user that will have problems with that, you need to keep that in mind. Um, so we, I just had a quick demo here showing you of, that's my wife's car actually. I don't actually drive that every day. This is how I, how I would, this is my car, this is how I do it. And highly recommend this to anyone out there is a Mazda 5 um, minivan and 
You just pull it in behind you. And uh, uh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Did you just implement a, a CPG in a new way there? <laughs> Seats low? Yes. Yeah, so Seats even. Demonstrating how, you know, raising my seat in a, in a minivan to get up a little bit higher is a nice way to transfer. We'll, we'll be talking more about transfers actually in a little bit as well. But there's just a couple of quick demos of, you know, loading chairs into, into cars and, and different ways to do it. Um, so again, there's just a reminder of what dynamic wheel mobility is. And, and we think of it in, in this framework right now, we're proposing really three different areas. Um, a lot of the stuff you've seen so far uh, uh, is dynamic reconfiguration, and we're going to end with that. But other two things we might want to keep in mind are add-on components um, and modular designs. And so we're going to uh, some of the add-ons. And I, I think this has just been an incredible area of, of uh, products in the last few years, and we've all kind of come to know and love, I think, um, like the free wheel and the smart drive. But when we look at our framework and our dynamic wheel mobility framework, um, there's kind of three issues with add-ons that we want to see addressed. And one of them, they have to be easy to put on and off, easily installed or removed by the end user themselves while they're in the wheelchair. Uh, secondly, they should be pretty transparent when they're, when they're not being used, so they don't get in the way, they don't make your chair heavy or clunky and these other things when they're not being used. Because we don't want to really re require changes to your base configuration, because your base configuration is very important, and therapists take a lot of effort to make sure it's configured properly. So, so like, for example, uh, the current power assist wheels, um, they actually do change the base configuration of the chair because of the weight, and typically it makes sense to move, 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 move them back a little bit further. Um, and and it, it, odds are that if you have a chair configured for power assist wheels, if you're going to uh, put regular wheels on, it's not going to be the right setup. So it does change, and that, that's the big difference is the transparency and the fact that a person still has a, a usual, a, a usual dialed-in chair um, if they're not using them. And the final point is just that, you know, really the user should not be dependent on that add-on for their day-to-day -day mobility. Um, so let's talk really quickly about add-on components. We think there might be three categories, uh, products that reduce rolling resistance, like the wheel blades that Steve just showed, um, a very small niche mechanical alternative to traditional wheeling, uh, and then power add-on systems. So let's go right into the free wheel. This is a, you know, one of my favorite products. I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to get uh, a very early version of it from some of the first ones that uh, Pat, uh, uh, an end user himself, uh, created several years ago. And I was absolutely amazed about how far I could get away from a paved road. And that, that picture doesn't do it justice, but I'm pretty far out on a hard packed sand beach and a lot of rock in, in the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, Secondly, the wheel blades that we've talked about already. And these little little cover slicers, these are actually taken from drawings for patents. And it, actually, if you're into, if you're into uh, wheel mobility stuff and you actually do a Google patent search, you can see some pretty ridiculous designs. Um, here's a couple of, we said, you know, I, I think of this as more of a niche uh, category. We don't see a lot of these, but they're legitimate products, lever drives that kind of attach on and off, magic wheels uh, as well. Um, but now, you know, being downstairs at the exhibit hall, you'll see the smart drive, and there's just, a, you know, a great example of a power add-on um, that is evolving. It, I think they're on their third or fourth uh, generation of it now. Yeah, it seems to be getting better all the time. Um, here's one that you may not be as familiar with, but it's a really neat product because I think, Steve, what's it, under $2,000? It's sub-$2,000, yeah. Um, and it's just an attachment, you know, a powered attachment to the front of your chair. It looks a little bit like a, a freewheel with a motor on it, but you can steer it. And that would classify as, as a, an add-on in our, our minds, because you can just leave it at the front door of your house or the store and you, when you're in the community and that sort of thing. And then finally, another product downstairs right now in the Spinergy booth, you'll see the, the ZX-1. This is a fairly recent uh, addition to the marketplace. And it turns and your it, manual chair into a power chair. And again, developed by an end user. Um, really quickly, we'll touch on modular designs, and really quickly only because there's just not a lot out there. Um, but perhaps in the future we'll see more. Here's the Lasher, the BTX, where you can take your cantilevered ultralight wheelchair, very nice, very light, rigid chair, and pop off the rear wheels, put on different casters, and all of a sudden you can have an off-road chair or you can have a, a beach, uh, beach chair. 
and um, a couple others. Uh, one, the striker, Serrano, which the, the guys that made the icon on the right, Christian and Jeff, uh, were working on earlier. Again, it's not on the market right now, but the icon is. It's downstairs. Uh, you can go check them out later on. And it, it is thinking about these things uh, in, in a similar way. So um, that's all we're saying about those two categories. Now we're going to, the rest of the talk is really going to be about this third category, about dynamic reconfiguration. Um, and we think there's four aspects of that. One of them, active stability management. So you can change the center of gravity, you can change your position in your chair so you're in different, you, you feel more stable, your chair is more stable, these sorts of things. Um, secondly, repositioning for propulsion. We talked about this base configuration. It's great for level, smooth floor wheeling. What about going up and down slopes and ramps? Um, we'll show you how you can get advantages doing that with the reconfiguration. Um, function, participation, ADLs, uh, these sorts of things. What it, it's a great example of changing your position to facilitate these sorts of things. And then finally, we'll show you some examples of transfers, how changing your position in your chair can help transfers. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm, I guess I'm the theory guy here. So we'll go ahead and, and um, basically these are just kind of common sense things that people may not necessarily think of. And a lot of times I came up with these these things because it's like I wondered why I couldn't do things in my chair and then it kind of sunk in after a while. The first one of these is the law of mutually exclusive configurations. That's basically that there's an inverse relationship between the optimal configuration for smooth level propulsion and just about everything else that a person has to do in a wheelchair. Um, most functional tasks, transfers, outdoor things, slopes. So there's an inverse relationship between the optimal configuration um, for propul propulsion because you're, you're lower and you tend to be further back in the chair to get minimal weight over the, over the casters. And for good biomechanical efficiency, especially if you, don't, if you need additional slope for trunk stability, you're gonna be sitting lower in the chair. Functional reach, on the other hand, is maximized when you're up at the front of the chair and sitting higher. Um, and, and like I said, most of the time, if you're, if you're doing any functional task in front of you, or just about any functional task, you're gonna be better off if you're at the front of the chair. There's Jamie in the elevation, his first one, he's kind of set up for propulsion, but it's not gonna get him to the top shelf. If he elevates, he makes it. The second one of these, is the, uh, of these rules is the conservation of contextual angles. Sounds kind of fancy, but it basically holds that changing the key angles of the ultralight, the user, or the environment is going to result in some sort of change rough, that's roughly equivalent in one of those other angles in order to offset the change. So in other words, if a person is sitting and they lean forward with 10 degrees of trunk flexion, then that to reach that same horizontal position, they're gonna to have to add another 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. So that has implications for not positioning the hand above the shoulder. Now, how can we possibly use the ultralight to implement the CPG? Um, this is, I believe this is from uh, some sort of uh, UN uh, accessibility thing, and it talks about, it's kind of like a way of implementing ADA-like guidelines. But there's a, there's a maximum zone of common reach and a, a, max, a comfortable common reaching zone. And this is for designed for a male, but it's also supposedly for a wheelchair. But you can see 90 is very low in that range. So how do you not position your hand upon the shoulder, above the shoulder? How? 10 inches of elevation. All of a sudden, in his, his, he's in those ranges. That's how. So a second way that the ultralight could effectively implement a CPG. Where you, is this your section here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, back to me. So um, now let's talk a little bit about propulsion and changing your seat position and your configuration and what that means. And um, quickly, what you know? Here's some. The ADA stands for ramps. It's about four to five degrees. Um, existing buildings like this one. Uh, seven degrees, but I'm, I think there's some, some ramps in here that are a little bit steeper than seven degrees, too, that I've encountered. Um, but minivans, um, they can be even steeper than that. So this can be, you know, obviously a large difficulty for people to go up ramps if they got a really tippy chair or if they're, say, tetraplegic and they have some strength issues, these sorts of things. So um, Steve's kind of come up 
with his own little case study. Um, he has his optimally configured wheelchair, his ultralight chair, and yet he's kind of anxious still about going up ramps. And why is that? Well, let's apply his rule of contextual angles. What does that mean? So here's his, his typical chair. You get a 95 degree back backrest, so it's a little bit reclined, pretty common. 14 degree seat slope, that's about what, three or four inches of dump, or seat slope? It's, a, it's about 4.25, somewhere there. Yeah. And now let's put him on a seven degree slope. And now look at the angles again. Now he's leaning quite a bit back further, well over 100 degrees. He's got a very steep slope now, so um, that's a little bit different too. And his center of gravity obviously is making him quite tippy. What about 10 degrees? It gets worse. So again, very you know, looking at it again for that total uh, L1 Steve showed earlier. That's not really a big problem. He has his angles that he can adjust with his trunk quite easily. But um, angle adjustment would help him too. How can we deal with this? Yeah, and there's no reaction force for pushing on the backrest because my backrest is going away from the direction I have to lean. <laughs> there so. he's doing a wheelie. Um, you can see the center of gravity again, and that's pretty much uh, what he's doing on a, on a steep slope, right, about a 10 degree slope. Not gonna be able to generate much power without the chair flipping backwards. So, so perhaps we haven't thought about it that way before, and and I, I'll be honest, I, I was using various prototypes and, and early configurations of this chair, <clears throat> and I talked about how the backrest maybe wasn't doing what I hoped it would do early on, and I, I was in it for a couple of years before I started realizing I could change my backrest angle when I go up and down slopes, and that might make a huge difference. And so I just kind of gave away the, uh, the, uh, the, one of the answer there. <clears throat> you change the angle of your seat to match or compensate for the slopes that you're dealing with. So here's a, a very, that's pretty much the same configuration that we saw with Steve's chair um, on the seven degree slope. Then you can just make the adjustments to compensate and then even on a slope, you can get back to that original kind of base configuration now of the 95 degrees and the 14 degrees. And what's it look like going downhill? Well, going downhill is even worse, I would argue, in a lot of ways, from, a, from at least from a safety standpoint. Um, that's what your normal chair would look like going down a hill if you're not in a wheelie, and that's what it looks like if you very quickly, in just a few seconds, implement a couple of quick changes to your seat. And here's what it looks like uh, on video. Um, Again, just taken with, with, with a, a smartphone, but um, I, I think th that these will demonstrate that there, that, that there is an appreciable difference. So that just so happens to be about a seven degree ADA one in 12 ramp. Um, you can see it's a, you know, I can, I can do it. I'm a pretty fit guy, but it's a bit of an effort. And as you, and it's really interesting when you look at my trunk position and we're going to compare that to the, um, and the next section of the video in a second. But the other thing, while you're looking at this in slow motion and think about this when, when we compare it in a minute, um, what if I had something on my lap? So I checked into the airport, the, the hotel today or yesterday, got a big bag in my lap and I go up a ramp. I couldn't get up that ramp. Um, in that configuration until I, again, move my, my seat to compensate for that. So, okay, now we went up in, again, my typical 95 degree, kind of what I'm sitting in right now. Now I can just bring my backrest forward to five degrees the other way, and I think it's, you can see that it looks a lot easier for me to go up. I'm taking shorter strokes, um, less elbow flexion, and again, when you see in slow motion here, you'll see the head remaining um, quite a ways away, away from the front caster. So the center of gravity has changed, the backrest has given me a reaction force to push against, and uh, it's a lot easier on my arms and shoulders. The and downside, you gotta take a few extra strokes, probably. So it's kinda like gearing a wheel or a, or a bicycle. So now, what about going downhill and where I come from in Vancouver, lots of hills and lots of rain. And again, I'll confess, I, I was in this chair for a couple of years until I'm on a, the top of a rainy, a rainy day on top of a hill, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go down that hill. It, I, I might slip and, and, and that sort of thing. And it kind of just, the light bulb went off. So that's how I would normally go down a hill, right, in a wheelie. Light bulb went off that I could just change my seat. I, oh my God, my chair does that. So why don't I do it? So I just put the backrest, I, I put the seat down all the way and I put the backrest back 
and you can go down really steep slopes now without having to be in a wheelie. When you, when you think of the fact that he doesn't have any trunk muscles, that, that, that's huge. So that is really, you know, as, as a user of this, one of my, you know, really favorite uses of that backrest is being able to do that in a, in a very controlled, safe manner, especially in rain. So I just, we just showed you that. There's other ways to do that now. That, let's talk about changing center of gravity and sliding the seat. And so Steve's going to talk about that with his, uh, his prototype chair or his concept chair. Yep. Okay, so I, I don't have dynamic back angle adjustability, so I don't, I, I'm not able to do that. But what I, what I am able to do so the, the, is um, slide the seat forward. Again, just two and a half inches. Um, but this, this, this is a similar chair and tippiness to what the chair I'm sitting in now is, which means a lot of leaning forward, a lot of very extreme joint angles. And, and what these side views don't show is they don't show the amount of abduction and, ex, and in, internal rotation I'm having to generate at those angles and then look at going up with the seat slid forward two and a half inches. So it's roughly 70 degrees, and I have to give a shout out to Health Aid of Ohio, our supplier at the Cleveland VA. And then this is in, in our, uh, back at REL, the Human Reverse Engineering Laboratory. This is a 10 degree ramp. This is something I, 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 I don't do in this chair, because it, this is kind of what happens. And I, I used to think it was me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a seating therapist, but I don't have skills to feel comfortable going up a minivan ramp. But when I'm thinking, I'm at a 24 degree seat slope without a back angle as I'm trying to go up there, it's no, it's no surprise. And, and the thing is, I kind of have to live the clinical practice guidelines. I'm a C8 Asia D. I don't have very good intrinsic muscles, and it, I'm only just a little bit away from twerking my wrist and not being able to, uh, to function. Watch what, again, two and a half inches using a sliding seat. 10 degree ramp. It's kind of like weightlifting, it's a lot of force, but the joint angles that I'm using there are, are not very high stress at all. So I told you earlier I was going to optimize an arc. That's exactly what I'm doing because gravity. The chair's going to roll backwards. You can't use a semicircular. It's got to be an arc. So if you're going to use an arc, why not make it a good arc? My elbow's staying greater than 90. My wrists are neutral. But that only makes sense to do that if you can put the chair there and then put it back because that would be very, a very front-heavy chair that would be impossible to propel on a lot of surfaces. So if I can pick this up on a Galaxy S5, I bet you Pearl or, or, or um, down, down, down Georgia Tech or, or, or where, you know, any place that does a lot of wheelchair-related research will be able to pick up those same differences. And I bet you if I can do that with a couple knobs, other manufacturers can think of it too. But until we get a chair that can actually do that, we do have um, some other ways of doing that on, on the horizon. One is the, uh, the lightweight, durable, adjustable composite backrest, which this was printed in assistive technology a few years back. Um, ADI has, has continued to evolve on that, and uh, Todd from ADI told me that um, th this angle adjustable version commercially might be available sometime during 2016. And then with um, quickie and key chairs, it's possible to make this, add that angle adjustable usability via modification. And that's to the way the, 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 the mechanism works. There's a, the backrest release lanyard when it's pulled will allow the back angle to be changed. And depending on the model, there's a couple different settings. The thing is, you have to have your weight off the back. So the thing is, is to go underneath. So this is just, this is a Tash uh, Microlite switch cable that was just from a damaged switch going through a body point frame saver clamp tied into a joystick knob. But then it allows the person to lean forward, reach under the seat, release the back lanyard that way. Now, obviously, there's going to be training with this because it does affect the stability of the chair. But it's our job is to train people to do these things. You need training to do a wheelie safely, too. And that can show the t kind of difference it would make. And with this gentleman, he was having a hard time transfer. He, there wasn't enough room in his office to use an office chair, but he wanted to sit comfortably at his desk but yet he'd still have to propel, so you like that angle of recline. And then propulsion on other surfaces and environments. 
Question, which of the following configurations would allow a person to get up a curb that's two and a quarter to three and a half inches with the least upper extremity strain? A rear tippy configuration, typical of what we would normally configure an ultralight, or a front heavy configuration? Here we are back at Corel. So I'm actually putting more weight on the front casters, but once those casters are up on that platform, the rest of the chair just follows. Now going down, it's harder to do a wheelie when it's like that, so you'd want to be able to, again, be able to put it back. It's also a very nice position to do functional activities because when the seat is slid up, you're also about an inch higher and you're closer to everything. Okay, then this is a three and a half inch platform. So in this case, I use that two and a half inches of wheelbase adjustability too. Seat forward. to put the frame in, I just, there's a couple little posts that swung around so I didn't have to keep bashing my toes. I just push up and it goes right in. And I, sh I should note that, that that chair is actually a little bit tippier than this chair. And that's because if I can play, if, if I'm able to change the amount of, the proportion of weight according to the conditions, then I can actually have a much, much less weight over my front casters the majority of the time. Um, than, than I would with this chair because there only has to be a little bit more weight on the casters than would be optimal. The other thing that can help is, is, is wheelbase. And that's because with the rear tippy configuration, if it's too short, when you try to push, the front casters will lift. I'm not reporting that this is scientific in any stretch of the imagination, but short chair with the axle move forward is gonna be, become very tippy. So this is just a little course, and I'm trying to go as quickly down to the stool, around. And you can see, I might, I might have the ability to do some ambulation, but I'm basically, I'm, I'm not able to move a whole lot in the trunk when I'm pushing. But my, my front caster's popped up 13 times. Now this is the same, same rear seat position, I'm just adding two and a half inches of wheelbase. So the front caster is lifted up just three times. Now, obviously, I'm not trying to sell anything. So, and, and Jamie and I, we're, you know, we're, we're not trying to act when we do these. We're trying to be as, as objective as we can as we're kind of doing these things. We know it's not evidence-based by any stretch, but it's just to kind of pique the curiosity of people that might be interested in researching such things. But that, that last configuration, where I found it was extremely helpful, is going through snow. Because I could have a very light front end, I could have gloves on and still, you know, not have great grip on the push rims, but because those casters kind of pop up, it kind of coasts over the snow. And if you see me pushing on this hotel carpet and kind of doing popping little mini wheelies, I'm doing that intentionally. That's to get my casters up and over. Um, may not be the best thing according to the researchers, but um, it, it works for me. And then the last area is sit pivot transfers. And this has really become, transfers have become one, recognized as one of those really important areas 
and preserving upper limb function where we suspect that, that there's a lot of peak forces. So this is just, again, subtle differences, but I think they, uh, they're compelling. So transfer one, I just have the seat all the way back. Transfer two, forward, two and a half inches. And like I said earlier, I, I do have some ability to ambulate, but I, I think I did a pretty good job of simulating a, uh, somebody that would have to just place their legs and not move them at all. So this again, seat back. This would not be all that unlike transferring out of my current chair. And since they're sitting here in the front row, I still have nothing against my Tylite. I love it. It's eight years old now. But might there be something more? Because, you know, I'm going to have to get another chair someday. Let's see how it goes now. So this is seat in half position. I'm kind of having to throw my body over more, and I'm not able to get as far forward as I'd like. My head's able to be farther forward, and I'm having to throw my body less. When we get back to when we look back at Gabe, I mean, I suspect that he was really having to throw his body over that wheel for many, many years, and that's one of those things that contributed. Look at the alignment there. Nose is well out in front of my toes there. When it was back, it was almost about where my shins are. And then I'm totally clearing the wheel. Again, subtle differences, but I think they're pretty significant. Um, now, with the, uh, in the elevation wheelchair, it's not the same as a sliding seat, but there's a lot of uh, advantages to transferring as well. Um, there's the quick schematic you, you see. Um, how that changes and how that, you know, the, leveling off the seat, how that can be a, a lot better. Um, can you think about you as a therapist, you configure in a chair for a client, a tetraplegic client perhaps, and you want to get a lot of dump, a lot of seat slope in their chair for their comfort, for their function, their ability to push uh, throughout the day. They might have a lot of difficulty transferring. And so if you have the ability to then just level out really quickly, that makes that, uh, that person a lot more functional. And so here's, um, Here's uh, actually my, my old mentor, actually, Gary Birch, um, who uses this chair. And we've hooked up a, a thumb strap for him, or the dealer and the therapist did. So he's able to use it you know, in, in that lower position. And that's how his typical position would be throughout the day. And then he levels off. And that then facilitates independent transfers for him a lot, a lot easier. Um, so there's you know Tetra client doing it, but the pair of, we we all do it. it. I want to make my transfers easier, and I certainly don't transfer from a, a dumped position like this. You know you have to kind of climb out of your out of your seat. Um, why not just flatten it out first if you can do it, and it makes life a lot easier. So that's really uh, that's that's our material, except for this last. Uh, really quickly, we'll talk about a couple of future topics and. Um, one thing that's really cool, if you guys go down to the Icon booth, um, Christian, one of the, uh, you know, the uh, inventors of the Icon and the principals behind the Icon wheelchair, he has a really cool chair down there right now that he built for himself, that he built uh, after he had children, and he wanted to, you know what, I want to play with my kids down low near the floor. And he came up with this chair, go check it out, it's down in the exhibit hall, that he's able to, while he's sitting in it, lower right down to the floor. He gets to about eight inches off the floor. Um, and coincidentally, um, we're actually starting a, a usability study in our lab uh, in just a month or two to evaluate a prototype that we've created with, a, with an elevation wheelchair, whereby when you can come down into six inches of dump or seat slope, there's now an, another function that we've created on a, on, a, on a different model where you can then drop the front end as well, six to eight inches. So again, get down to that low floor um, access, 
And honestly, it was almost the same reason that Christian came up with it. It was an, after I had children, I was like, well, you know, I kind of like to get down there and play with them. But then it also kind of dawned on me um, for Florida Sea Transfers. Um, wow, here's a great thing maybe for a Florida Sea Transfer. If you want to access the floor or if you fall out of your bed or your chair, as we all do from time to time during transfers and these sorts of things, if you get back into a chair that's six or eight inches off the floor versus 19 inches off the floor, what would that do for your upper limbs? And that sort of thing. So there's a great example of some future topics that are kind of somewhat being developed right now. Um, and again, I encourage you to go down the icon booth and check out uh, what they've done down there. It, 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 it is. It, it's it's awesome, and, and it's hard to even imagine a chair being able to do what that chair is doing um, until you actually see it. And if you just see it back there and they're they're, they're not around, you're not really going to realize it. So just um, inquire about it and ask ask them to show it to you. Um, because it, it, it is really impressive. So what we were kind of hoping is that we can maybe engage in some discussion here. Because um, we would like to see ultralights change. Got some manufacturers in this audience. We have some researchers in this audience, um, and in addition to clinicians. And I mean, we kind of know who signed up for it. And I, I couldn't be more pleased with the group that we, we had signed up for this. So um, we'll just open it up for any sort of uh, discussion. Sure. So we've done some pressure mapping, um, and as you would expect, as you go from you know very low to very high, pressure distribution changes. But it's not a clinically relevant um, pressure relieving tool. It's it's probably a clinically relevant, um, beneficial thing to do. I, I think we don't have proof of that, but just the you know changing your position throughout the day does alter the distribution of pressure. But it's not like going to a 40 degree. 45 degree tilt, um, which you would use as a clinical pressure relief. I don't know if you want to add any context to these. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's from, um, I forgot we had these. Uh, so there's four users, four subjects going from, that's, you know, 15 degrees of slope down to level, probably, next slide, and then 15 degrees up. And you can see changes from ischials to sacrum and that sort of thing and how it just changes. But again, it's not. That's not the 40 degrees of tilt. But what is interesting, uh, I forget which uh, talk I was at earlier today, they talked about one of the effective ways of pressure relief was doing leaning and, and as opposed to just weight lifts, uh, which are potentially hard on your shoulders. So if you're able to get out of your dumped slope position to a level seat, it might be easier for you to do um, weight relieving maneuvers um, you know, when you're at your desk or that sort of thing, as opposed to being down in that slope. So. Yep. And one of the things, if you, if you do get an opportunity, and, and I'm not pitching Jamie's product, we have yet to prescribe one at the Cleveland VA, I'll say that. Um, that may not last much longer, but um, it, it is if you can actually see the, this anti-shear mechanism that he's, that he's kind of designed in here. Because you do think of that, that rear seat height being above level that a person's going to slide. And actually, the way this thing's designed is kind of clever. It, does, it provides like a shelf that, that kind of supplements the seat, so it's actually, you're not really sliding down. There's, you're still sitting uh, relatively level. Anything else? Other questions? Comments? Ian. Yeah, that's it's an interesting point, and I think in that video I kind of I kind of showed. Um, I Me, mean, I was actually at the top stopping, and I and I changed my position. And um, in reality, if I'm just wheeling out in the community, and I can't do it up on this this ramp very well, but um, I'm actually moving. I can be moving and doing that too, right? And I can change my my seat back while I'm moving. If and that's certainly the first users uh, that that. Uh, that get in the chair, they're not gonna be able to do that, but you are able to do it on the fly, and 
I'm not sure, Ian, if I've tried a steep ramp from one to the other in the middle of in the middle of the ramp, but I imagine if we sat sideways, we'd hopefully be able to do that a little safer. But um, no, it's a it's a good point. Yeah. In terms of them prescribing? Well, I, I think we can all use some education. A little bit of background on me. I, I was injured back in 82. I'm ambulatory, but I, I didn't start using a wheelchair until about eight years ago. And by that time, I was already a seating therapist. So one thing I know is, as a clinician, I, I didn't know what's required to, to, to really do good wheelchair skills. And when I hear clinicians that really have a good understanding, like Ian, um, of, of those different forces at play, and using it and thinking about those environments is something. Um, but the thing is, you know, when we're teaching people to do wheelies, you know, there's also there, there's a risk factor there. It's, it's basically giving people the tools and, under, and allowing them to understand what it is that we're actually, you know, what, what their chairs can do and what the limitations are. Because the environment, you, you, they're going to encounter it regardless. Uh, I'd say, you know, give them, give them the tools. I mean, you could definitely do more by having a tippy chair with anti-tippers than you can if it's set up so stable that they can't get over, you know, a, a four-inch, or, or, I mean, a, you know, couple inch uh, crack in the sidewalk. Um, An another um, thing to consider is uh, the trade-offs that the therapists have to consider when they're configuring a wheelchair in terms of the front seat height, rear seat height, seat slope, and these sorts of things. Uh, and typically it is a trade-off. And I've heard comments uh, this week about how therapists will simply not put someone into a really steep seat slope, seat slope because they don't want them to sit like that all day, even though the client wants that for function. So this, if you have a chair that is on the fly configurable, it I think takes the onus off the therapist a little bit in terms of having to dial in that chair properly. Um, and I don't know if I can put Joanne on the spot. Do you want to speak to, as a therapist prescribing a chair, this chair before into a client that was coming from a, a typical static chair? But in terms of, edu from an education of the client standpoint? I think, again, um, many of the people who have been long-time users of wheelchairs, so it's just ensuring that they understood the benefits of the chair worked and the setup. I think with the new user, I would probably, certainly, I mean, we're, we're focusing a lot on whether they're using a, a dynamic uh, chair or a non-dynamic chair, we're still focusing on the skills that they need to be able to and that, that, that backrest adjustment mechanism on a quickie or a key chair, it's, it's been there for years. Yeah, and uh, again, when you get a new client into a, 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 a this elevation chair in particular, um, you definitely want to use a seat belt. I mean, it ships with a seat belt, for instance, because um, coming up for the first time can be a little bit of, of a shock, I guess. Um, but one thing coming up does, it actually makes you less tippy, so you're actually very stable backwards. The big issue from an education standpoint is that backrest adjustment. and. 
I'm, we're using that functionally. You want to be tippier going down slopes, for instance. You might, be, you might want to use it for, for dressing and angling back a little bit and these sorts of things, but you, there you might move your center of gravity forward first to make yourself less tippy. But the point is that's where the education has to come in and you make sure that the client realizes that they're affecting their tippiness. And the other thing, you can you send it home with them with anti-tippers to begin with as well um, that they can then use if they want and then as they get more comfortable with the chair, they can then take off um, if they want to, so. We have a few more minutes if uh, there's any other comments or questions.